Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. So we have another show, and anything that I say is definitely not meant to cure you or replace your medical care. Check with your doc before taking any of these recommendations. Have a lot of great guests and a lot of great uh, quizzes for you. So let's just dive right in. We sure do, and uh, in no particular order. Actually, it is a particular order. We have in our green room Harry from Melbourne, Australia, and it's about 3 o'clock in the morning there, so uh, having mercy on him, we're going to bring him into the show first. And Harry, if you're unmuted, you're on with Dr. Bird. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh, good morning, Dr. Berg. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, all the guidance and support. You probably don't know the difference that you make. Um, I'll uh, dive right in. I've written it down here just so that I don't waste every, everyone's time. Um, I've been diagnosed with uh, H. pylori, SIBO, high cholesterol, um, uh, a number of other things. But th these are the main, main items. After multiple failed treatments to H. pylori, both conventional medicine as well as natural remedies, and including some of the remedies that you recommend, uh, it, it still remains in my system. Um, I, uh, the symptoms are lack of energy, lethargy, extreme bloating, uh, no strength, short of breath. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the minute I do any kind of activity, uh, um, uh, the, um, on, on blood testing, the blood inflammation levels are st uh, good. Uh, uh, there's deficiency uh, in active B12. Uh, 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 LDL, uh, as I just mentioned, high, 4.8, when it needs to be about 2. Um, I'm on, on a lot of supplements, uh, uh, you know, the, the enzymes before food, uh, broccoli sprouts, uh, the uh, zinc um, uh, with food, uh, other supplements such as turmeric coffee, empty stomach, um, uh, B12, B1, iodine, uh, uh, lipoic acid, acid, vitamin C, spot, uh, niacin. Uh, I, 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 and I, and I guess the issue is H. pylori and SIBO, which are kind of, uh, you know, when you're trying to fix SIBO, you can't fix H. pylori, and when you're fixing H. pylori, you can't fix SIBO. Um, and and it's been two years. Uh, uh, it it just. I, I'm not able to live a normal lifestyle. I, I don't know what to do. Okay. So that was a great one, one question, a quick, quick one, but I'm going to uh, tell you what I would recommend. Okay. Um, and you can watch this later because I'm going to go quite rapidly. The thing with a uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is you have a competition between um, these microbes and your own body. They're stealing all your nutrition. So they're, they're leaving you deficient, so that's why you have to take it because it's these microbes should be kind of hanging out in the in the large bowel, but they're hanging out in the small in, small intestine, and so there you shouldn't have all this fermentation going on there because it's the wrong place. So that's why you get the bloating. So one thing you have to be careful about is um, feeding them. Um, so I would cut off any fiber and go carnivore right away because if you give them fiber from plants or anything. Um, they'll eat it. They'll um, eat it and they'll keep, keep alive. Um, the most important probably supplement would be betaine hydrochloride in larger amounts. If you can tolerate, let's say, I don't know, 10 tablets before each meal, um, that will uh, acidify the stomach. Okay. So then now we got an acid stomach. It'll stop these microbes from uh, any other microbes from the food going into the small intestine. It'll kill things off. It takes a while to build that up, um, but that will also help uh, trigger the bile salts, the bile. So you probably have to take some purified bile salts after the meal and also on empty stomach, play around with the dosage. And because think about this, the bile, I think you have a bile problem because the bile normally made by the liver that goes in the gallbladder, goes in the small intestine. And one function is to make sure uh, all these microbes in the small intestine can't survive. So it's like a detergent. It kills microbes. So it sounds like you don't have that happening. So if we do the bile salts as well as HCL, hydrochloric acid from the betaine hydrochloride, then we can actually um, 
do good things. Um, now, the other icing on the cake is going to be the fasting. I would highly recommend uh, have one meal a day and then do do prolonged fasting maybe once a week until you can have good housekeeping and that you you have a flush of all these different uh, microbes out of the body because that way you can actually starve them off and then your body can live on your ketones, which is your stored fat. So that would be like the most important things to focus on right now. Um, but, um, and then once things are better, then what you can do is then you can start adding like, uh, the, maybe the probiotic foods and things like that back in there, like sauerkraut, stuff like that. But, um, you got to get the system back on track. Sounds great. All right. Harry, thanks so much for coming to us from uh, Melbourne. And we hope that you call us back and uh, let us know just how that all went. And let's go to social media. So first up from Facebook uh, is Chris. How can I improve uh, upon getting sleepy after I eat? Uh, He gets very sleepy after he eats. So how can we uh, help Chris out? Well, um, it depends. If you're eating, eating donuts or fine carbs and you're getting sleepy, then you got a blood sugar crash. Uh, but if you're not, then uh, two things, either take the, this thing called betaine hydrochloride to help you digest the food. Uh, you may be eating too much protein, which could also kind of uh, turn in the sugar and make you kind of tired if you overload protein. Um, but definitely start, get, get rid of any carbs that will help you. And then the last thing to, uh, to realize though, some people, you know, I, I talk to some people and they're like, they're not doing carbs and they're still getting tired. And and their, their stomach is fine, but I find out they just don't get enough hours of sleep. And, um, that's a, a problem that, um, can easily be solved if you watch the sleep video. So those are three simple, quick things that you could wrap your wits around. Terrific. Okay. Now you won't need to, um, struggle over answering this because it's not a question. It's a statement. Don, uh, Don Louis from YouTube. I've lost 22 pounds. On your program, and my stomach acids are going strong. Thank you, Dr. Berg. So thank you, Don, for letting us right. know. And congratulations on your great weight loss. Uh, Lu Yu from YouTube, I've tried your butter chicken recipe, and even my fussy five-year-old ate it. Thanks, Dr. Berg. Looking forward to trying more of your recipes. And we've got to also ring the bell for Karen, because I know she's got her, his lovely wife's got her hand in all these delicious things as well in the recipes. Uh, let's see, why don't we talk about who is joining us beyond uh, our first guest here, Harry from Melbourne. I'd like to say a good morning to all our viewers joining us today from the UK, Canada, Mexico, Ireland, Israel, Pakistan, Sweden, Bermuda, Jordan, uh, Antigua, Poland, uh, Albania, Thailand, Norway, Egypt, Scotland, Tibet, India, Nepal, Japan, Chile, Germany, Denmark, Uruguay, Algeria, Zimbabwe, Iran, France, Tunisia, Indonesia, Greece, uh, Nabimbia, uh, I think uh, Terry's trying to get me to say that right. One day I will. Nabmia, I guess it is anyway. Oman, Slovakia, uh, uh, Chechnya, Switzerland. Boy, Chechnya, I haven't heard from them before, I don't believe. Uh, Eritrea, uh, Eritrea, United Arab Emirates, Jamaica, Uh, Guyana, Romania, Qatar, I think this is a record, the Netherlands, Brazil, Taiwan, Paraguay, Malaysia, the Virgin Islands, Finland, Peru, South Africa, Turkey, Hong Kong, Trinidad and Tobago, Australia, there you go, Nicaragua, Kenya, the uh, Philippines, Nigeria, Iran, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, Montenegro, Croatia, Estonia, Palestine, uh, welcome Palestine, Belgium, and all across these United States. So thanks everybody for checking in. Uh, and let's go straight back to social media. Uh, Thomas from Facebook, I've been reading about the keto diet can uh-oh, cause thyroid issues and causing people to go on thyroid medicine. Have you come across these cases in your research, that awful keto? Yeah, it's a dangerous thing, cutting out those carbs. I tell you, it just leads to all sorts of side effects. Um, it's completely false. I mean, if you keto is really the reduction of carbs. It doesn't really talk about the quality of food, doesn't talk about the nutrition. So uh, if you're doing something called the healthy version of a ketogenic diet, um, your thyroid is not going to be a problem. In fact, you're going to be more efficient to the point where the thyroid doesn't have to work so hard 
And you may even not need as many of those thyroid hormones to have everything work. So you may see a, a, a little bit of a lowering of um, like T4 or even T3, but it, it'll be within normal range. But the, the thing that people diagnose hypothyroidism with is uh, something called the thyroid stimulating hormone. That's a pituitary hormone uh, that will always just stay normal. So um, nothing to worry about. Um, you're just eating healthy foods with low carbs. So uh, for someone to say it's going to damage the thyroid, why? Because the thyroid needs carbs? Like explain that to me. I'd like to see just one study to show that. It's illogical. Yep. That makes sense to me. I'll heed from YouTube. How can I increase my HDL? It's always between 28 and 30. Boy, that does sound low. I'm 47 and on blood pressure meds. I get my blood tested every four months. Everything is normal except for this really low HDL. Well, I would, um, um, one thing that causes low um, human growth uh, hormone would be age. So, how do you solve that, right? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. Exercise, intense exercise with a lot of rest will increase growth hormone. Also, more sleep will increase growth hormone. Um, arginine is a supplement that will kill two birds with one stone. It will help increase arginine, plus it will help you with blood pressure because it's kind of like a precursor to the something called nitric oxide, which supports the inside of the vascular system, uh, which I will release a video on that too. Um, I mean, if you think these, the medications for blood pressure, you have the big one that's always given, which is a diuretic, uh, which depletes potassium and magnesium, which the two things that you need to keep the blood pressure low. And then you have the ACE inhibitors, and then you have the uh, calcium channel blockers. So these things uh, all just um, have side effects. And, um, um, as far as growth hormone goes, going back to sticking on that topic, I would definitely focus on going low carb, okay, because too much sugar will inhibit uh, growth hormone. And then, um, and then also the sleep and the exercise. Um, and then, of course, you can throw in the arginine too, but um, only, only if you really need it. Um, but make sure your exercise has enough recovery so you get enough, uh, so you don't overtrain because that will because the cortisol, the stress will really shut it down too. Uh, search on my video on growth hormone. I have uh, quite a few and uh, I give a lot of additional things to do. All right, sounds great. And by the way, in, when Dr. Uh, Berg says search, here's a great way to do it. He's got his nice app that we've talked about. You can get it on, uh, you know, on Mac or any of the Android phones. So make sure you check that out and find the answers to your many questions. All right. Uh, let's see, uh, you're enough is the handle from this person on YouTube. Can a colloidal silver help, uh, with bowel issues like diverticulitis? I don't think that would be the, the best remedy. It wouldn't hurt. It's good for uh, a lot of things related to infection. So if there's an infection down there, yeah, it'd probably be, be good. But with the bowel related, I mean, if I, if I wanted to become a medical doctor, I'd probably be a GI doc because it would be so easy and so dramatic to turn things around because one thing these uh, GI doctors don't really emphasize enough is the, the food. Here they're studying the digestive tract, but they don't really get into the connection between what you eat very much. It's mainly here, take an anti-spasmodic medication, an acid, take pain pills and go get some Pepto-Bismol, you know? So it's like, um, what about the food, the food that you're eating and especially inflammation in the colon, um, uh, bone broth. Like if you made a, made your own bone broth, you, you buy some bones and you cut them in half or you buy them already cut in half and you make your own bone broth with in with a stew, some fatty meat in there. Uh, the fat is really good. Uh, you can even put vegetables in there, cook it down with some spices, garlic, that would be a really good um, gut healing food that, um, that all that without collagen and uh, um, bone broth. I mean, that's going to really help your gut in a big way. So that would just be like one simple thing I would recommend rather than quite a little silver, which might not create the um, impact that you want. Sounds great. And black butter fly from YouTube is an A1C of six or 6.5. Okay. Will keto make a difference? 
Well, it all depends what you what it used to be. If it was seven before, now it's six point five, and then it's good. Um, it's you want to get it down to like five point five or even a little bit less uh, because you're measuring um, an average blood sugar over a few months, like th- maybe three two months. And um, what what's happening is you're measuring how much sugar got stuck to that uh, hemoglobin, and then the red blood cells die. So then the cycle starts all over. So you can kind of see how much sugar you've been eating, which is interesting because all the people that say, well, I don't eat sugar. And then they, and then they go, well, just on the weekends. Well, you're looking at an average of blood sugar. So if you calculate those days in there, um, you're going to, it's going to be higher. So that's why I like A1C even better than a blood sugar because uh, just a typical blood glucose test, because you can, you really see what's happening if the person's cheating or not, not they would ever cheat, but, yeah, well, I think they do. And by the way, if I might, a friend of mine just got denied surgery a couple of days ago. He has a stenosis in his neck. And they said his his A1C of 8.5 or something is too high. And until he gets it down to 6.5, they're not going to cut him open. Is 8.5 really bad? It's, it's not that great. I mean, I've seen people have up to 11. <laughs> so it's not good. Um, it just tells me they're eating too many carbs. Well, he does. He's a, a mini Snicker bar fanatic, so it shouldn't be too hard for him to behave. All right, why don't we go back to our green room? Mark is our next sleepiest guy uh, on the ramp. He's in Southern California. Was uh, on the air or on the queue with us at uh, seven thirty in the morning. And Mark, if you'll unmute yourself, we'd ask your one question in thirty seconds. Go. Good morning, Doc. Good morning. Hey, I'm using a couple of your supplements, and I already have call in to the customer service and ask what makes a complete supplement regimen. And what I have, what I was told is this, the D3 plus the K2, the keto energy, the organic raw wheatgrass, and the trace minerals, those four items. Would that be a complete supplement? Yeah, I think I would probably just add one little thing, and that's the electrolytes, because that way you can get the the benefit of potassium. It's so wild that they... That's the powder, I'm sorry. That's the yeah. powder drink. Okay, and I have that also. That's oh, right. Then you're then you're good to go. That's actually okay. plenty, and you're going to be in good shape. But it's, you know, you try to find a potassium supplement. It's really only like 99 milligrams they sell it in. So, I mean, we need right. 4,700 mil- milligrams. So that's always on the low side. But yeah, it sounds like a good protocol. I think you'll yeah. enjoy that. So how much of that should I use the electrolyte drink? How much of that should I use it per day? I think you, I think you just need one, one to one. enhance your diet. Um, depending yeah. on what you're doing. I mean, if you have a, a lot of fluid retention, you can take more, or if yeah. you, um, let's say you exercise, uh, you want to spike your yeah. energy, take that right before you work out, watch what happens. I think you'll, you'll see a, a shift in your energy. Yeah. I am I'm about six, one, one ninety three. I have dropped about seven pounds. Since I've started following you, wow, I have that's great. Getting to the, cause I'm not extremely. I have a lot to weight to lose, but maybe another five or ten wouldn't be bad. So that's great. Sounds but, like. You know, I appreciate your stuff. It's good. It's very reasonable and good information. So thanks, Mark. That's great. You're thanks welcome. so much for joining us, Mark. We appreciate it. Good and day. as you continue right. to. Uh, drop down in weight and increased health. We always love to have our participants come back and, and uh, give us another glimpse at their progress and so on. So thank you for that. Oh, you know what? Boy, I've, I've bombed out on the questions. Let's get going here, Doc. Here's the first one. Okay. So um, uh, let me try to click this thing to see if I could pop it up so I could see. Here we go. Okay, good. Okay, the best antidote for salt sensitivity is fill in the blank. Now, salt sensitivity is the kind of like where you uh, you eat salt and you retain fluid, you t- retain sodium and you're retaining fluid. So, what is the best remedy for that? The antidote to that salt sensitivity. That sounds great. And audience, I know you'll help me out. Uh, I am remiss in not getting these up quick enough. So, launch into that. And we're going to get all five quiz questions answered uh, in spite of my tardiness on that issue. Okay, let's go back to. Uh, social media, Mary from Facebook, what could be behind a craving for vinegar? That's interesting. Well, I think, I think there's many reasons, but um, it could be that you need more um, help with your digestion. Um, But also um, acetic acid in the vinegar has um, amazing benefits. 
that uh, uh, help to reestablish like pH, for example. So let's say your pH is running more on uh, the alkaline side than it should. Um, then um, you probably crave acids. So that could be one reason. And you take it and you're like, wow, I feel so much better. Like people can even breathe better because the pH um, comes back to where it needs to be. Now, some people will say, well, I thought the pH was supposed to be alkaline. Well, that's, you're looking at the blood, right? It should be slightly alkaline, but um, sometimes it's just off a little bit, either too high or too low, too acid or too alkaline. And so we need it in this very narrow range. And so um, that's kind of what everything is revolves around is that blood pH. But um, realize that every part of your body has a different pH. So um, um, your stomach is really acid. So don't, don't try to just alkalize the body thinking that that's the most healthiest thing in the world because you can end up alkalizing your stomach and creating a whole bunch of problems. Very good. Okay, Manpreet from YouTube. I am 38, a vegetarian, and have hypothyroidism. I have tried everything to lose weight, but no success. Please share your best advice. It's difficult being a vegetarian because um, it's hard to keep your carbs low and keep the fat high and keep all the nutrition in. But I think you said you're not a vegan, a vegetarian, so you can have eggs, right? So um, maybe have more eggs. Um, but the couple things to really look at is your results are going to be dependent on you really addressing that insulin resistance and keeping the insulin as low as possible by cutting down the carbs. So you can do it, but it's just more difficult. You cut down the carbs, you get more sleep. Um, you make sure that your, um, your stress is as low as possible. Go for long walks, do physical activity outside to keep the stress down and exercise. Um, these, and I have a huge list of additional things. If you plateau, um, what you could do is pull up my videos based on plateauing and lo always look at the most recent one because th those are the most updated one. Like today I'm going to be doing a, some updated videos on um, things that I found related to blood pressure that I, I like, you need to know this if you have blood pressure. So I'm always constantly finding new things. So stay tuned for that. But um, that's what I would recommend. All right, very good. Uh, and we must go to Crestine from YouTube. Can you talk about the best diet plan and supplements for someone who has been diagnosed with breast cancer? We're, hard, we're sorry to hear that, Crestine. What do you think, Doc? That too, I would find my most recent uh, video on cancer. We, there's a protocol that you can download um, that I'm not making any claims, but there's a little protocol that I would recommend of what I would do if I had cancer. Um, there's going to be a lot of fasting involved, like prolonged fasting. Depending on how severe the, the cancer is, the more fasting you need to do. Um, I do not provide any supplements for this protocol. Um, but uh, we, we list out a protocol that will help to inhibit a certain pathway that's involved in the cancer cells making their membranes. And if you can starve them off of that, um, there's some really good research to actually make the cancer go bye-bye. But uh, again, read that, look at it, um, decide. Um, and then, of course, check with your doctor before implementing any of these crazy suggestions. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, audience, uh, who immediately answered the first question, which asked, the best antidote for salt sensitivity is, and 80% uh, of our respondents say potassium or magnesium, and 10% say uh Coenzyme, Q, uh, uh, I'm sorry, QQ10, uh, uh, and 5% say calcium, and 5% say drink more water. Yeah, the answer is potassium. Yeah, potassium and sodium work together. Um, so many people are focused on reducing sodium instead of increasing potassium. Sodium does no longer become sensitive if you get the ratios right, if you increase your, your potassium. You need twice as much potassium as you do sodium. And then when you're low in potassium, guess what? Your body retains sodium. So it's like, it's not good. Um, a lot of problems go away uh, when you increase potassium, especially if you have any problem with sodium or uh, anything related to that. And with some people, they're low on sodium and then they're low on potassium. And so now they don't have those key electrolytes to keep things going. So they're going to be always tired and things like that. 
So in some cases, they need to take more sea salt and then they make more potassium and to get that those electrolytes working and then they, they'll feel so much better, so much better because then they'll have more volume of fluid in their body and um, they'll have more blood. But um, these are really key nutrients to power the nervous system, which is connected to your muscles. So you're going to have more nerve support with, as well as muscle power. Very good. Okay, next question, Doc. Here it is. All right. The primary symptom of low sodium is fill in the blank. Climb on it, audience. Okay, let's see. Claire from YouTube, is a low-carb diet recommended for children who are diabetics? Especially, especially because the very thing that caused the diabetes in the first place was too many carbs. Now, if they are a diabetic type 1, um, that's an autoimmune condition and they still need the same diet because then they can actually at least reduce the quantity of medication they're taking. And um, because, I mean, that's a proven fact. If you are a diabetic type one, the more carbs you take, the more medication you need. Well, okay. So why don't we just take the least amount possible uh, by getting on the right diet? Very good. Of course, always monitor your blood sugars because things will change. Like if, if, if you're afraid, if a doctor is afraid of a patient developing hypoglycemia because of reducing their carbs, well, then just make some adjustments on the medication and watch what happens. I mean, it's just the medication is there to lower the blood pressure, blood sugar. So if your blood sugar comes down and you're still taking medication, that would not be logical. All right. Thank you, Dr. Berg, for that. Anna from Facebook, how can I treat lymphedema? That's a difficult one um, because the lymph, lymph system is... Um, you know, when you have the, like the, even the valves in the lymph system that are overstretched and you have these dilation of, of the lymph nodes and, um, or lymphatic system and you're retaining fluid. Um, what, what I think the best thing to do is to increase the exercise to, because the lymph system is a passive system and it needs, um, it doesn't have, um, like a muscular pumps, like the basket, like the arteries do. So if you were to, actively stay in motion and do more of that, um, that, that would help you to a large degree. All right. Very good. Let's see. Um, Malcolm, who's from Scotland on Facebook, I'm suffering from indigestion and acid reflux and diarrhea, the big trifecta of suffering. What sort of adjustments do I need to make, uh, to my diet so that you can overcome this terrible thing? So, so, so we have three things there, there, um, Say that again. There's oh, sure. Things. There's he's he's got indigestion, acid okay. reflux, and to top it off, some diarrhea. This is an easy one. Very easy. Anytime you have indigestion, all that means is you need to get more acid in your stomach. And what's going to happen? Um, then the valve, the valve on the top of the stomach will close, so you have less backup of uh, acid coming into your esophagus. And uh, you'll probably have more complete digestion, which means it'll probably help your diarrhea. Uh, but don't forget to for, uh, take a probiotic if you have diarrhea. That's important. Uh, but um, betaine hydrochloride, the betaine hydrochloride should be your go-to supplement. And sometimes you need a lot of it. So start off with like maybe three with a meal and then go up. I keep adding one until these symptoms go away. And you may end up taking 10 before a meal. My guitar teacher found out he had to take like nine or 10 uh, for symptoms go away. So then he could go back to consuming his uh, large hamburgers and stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not the goal. The goal is to Aww. get your diet cleared up. I know, I know it's shocking. All right, very good. Well, uh, what also is not shocking is our audience's quick response to our questions. I think I'm going to call us caught up. And the last one asked, the primary symptom of low sodium is 75% uh, say fatigue or dizziness, 15% say headaches, and 10% say low blood pressure. Any, uh, any geniuses out there? There's, there's, there's one really big one that happens first, and that is weakness. You will feel weak in the muscles. Hmm. Anytime you feel weak, take a little sea salt and like, wow, I feel so much better. Uh, so that would explain too, um, like if you're exercising and you feel kind of weak, um, 
sometimes um, you just need a little sea salt and then boom, your muscles like respond. I'm not talking about where you have this, you hit the wall where you're exercising, you deplete your glycogen and that's completely different. I'm talking about just weakness in general. All right. I think we'd probably give that to the 75%. They say fatigue and so on. Maybe you're on the right track, folks. So thank you for that. Let's see. Peg from Facebook. Mm -hmm. I have stage three liver fibrosis and I've lost 35 pounds. That's a great start. I am not hungry at all and have a hard time eating sufficient salads, veggies, and protein. I eat once a day around 5 p.m. What can I do to supplement my diet? I think you're on the right track. I would make sure if you have the um, fibrosis um, is to take tocotrienols. That's a really good one for the liver. Um, uh, the other thing is, um, yeah, I like the idea of the one meal a day. So what you probably will have to do is uh, eat your meal and, and maybe even maybe, I don't know, wait a little bit and then have your, maybe your salad because it is hard to eat everything in one time. So uh, that it's always a situation, but you can enhance it with um, a greens product, a really high quality one. And of course, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not biased of my own greens product, but something like that would be good. That's freeze dried. That's um, um, doesn't have high heat. Um, one thing I'm looking at um, also recommending is to like, if you had, so you have this huge salad, right? And you have a hard time doing all that. Well, you could also, you could eat more, um, you can do sprouts or these uh, mini greens, these uh, uh, these smaller, like the little, um, they're called microgreens. And that would actually have um, more concentrated properties for the liver, phytonutrients and things like that. So maybe you can have a little less of that um, and get by with the uh, concentrated nutrition. So the microgreens, um, of the wave of the future. Um, uh, yeah, sometimes if you, they're growing them hydroponic, uh, if you have the, if you have the option of getting them from growing on dirt, that would be better. There's, if you happen to live in Washington, DC or Maryland, there's a farmer's market in Bethesda that's on Sundays that, uh, they, they grow theirs in, um, soil and i really like them uh like that company but um because they're like doing it right it, so you'd stop there and get get your microgreens wow i think we're going to need a new bell here sarah from facebook has lost 80 plus pounds with fasting and your healthy keto since july thank you dr berg that's a great uh, great thing to hear sarah congratulations fantastic okay let's see <laughs> here's another boy all these uh, names giving with a purpose is asking what are some natural ways to address narcolepsy i am on several medications and struggling thank you dr berg yeah that's a tough one um the i think the best thing to do um well I, without getting into the history of what happened just before that um because i do know that um that can happen after certain vaccines, which I can't really talk about too much right now. But I will say, um, if you start taking more B1, okay, higher amounts of B1, that can help you. But um, I tell you what, though, I will do a video, I'll work on the video on that to give you a more complete answer just to give you the whole, whole scoop. All right. Well, uh, Abraham from Modesto, California, seems like a nice fellow. So uh, we will put him on in the hopes that that's true. Go ahead with your one question, Abraham. Yes. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hello. Um, I just want to know if I could still lose fat without having my gallbladder. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You, you could you could do fine. You could actually um, consume more fat. It just it just a matter. Here's what's happening, right? You don't have the um, the gallbladder in. The gallbladder has a very important function that is not emphasized. It concentrates that bile. That means that uh, if you don't have a gallbladder, it's not going to be as concentrated. So you might not get the complete breakdown of that fat. So you have two things. You got the bile, and then it releases the pancreas that helps you uh, break down from an enzyme standpoint. So you have this mixture here that's going on. So um, I would take uh, some 
bile salts right after the meal, maybe a few. And I think you'd be fine. I think you'll be totally fine. And now the way that you know that um, it's working is that if your stool is floating, that means that there's fat in the stool. That means it's not, it's not working. <laughs> so you need more of uh, this bile. If, it, if your stool is uh, dark and tarry and it leaves a skid mark, that means you might need help from the pancreas. You need enzymes, especially lipase. If um, the stool is light colored and pale or gray, that means you need more bile. Uh, if you have diarrhea, you've taken too much. <laughs> so these are just little indications of how to make the adjustments without doing an expensive test. That does make sense. I have been trying your gallbladder formula here. Okay, good. And then also, um, you might, you might, it might be like one or two might be enough. Uh, so I think, uh, I think you'll be fine on that. For, and some people, um, somehow, um, the way the ducks adapt, they even grow a gallbladder back. I'm not kidding. So who knows? You might grow one back. Well, that. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks so much, Abraham. I'm going to award you the award for the most succinct question we've ever had on our show. And that uh, is fantastic. And we wish you all the best, uh, sans gallbladder, uh, you know, as you move forward. All right, let's see. Let's go back to social media. Uh, oh, here we go. Choose, uh, uh, Choose Joy is, is the name from YouTube. What are the best natural ways to treat hypothyroidism and Graves' disease? Well, I always like when uh, people ask me questions to treat diseases. Um, and of course, um, check with your doctor, but um, it's an autoimmune disease. So it's a, it's more than a thyroid problem. It's an autoimmune disease. So the thyroid is working too hard. And um, there's a lot of triggers to this. Um, it's funny that uh, I just talked about B1 being a remedy for so many things, but B1 is a good remedy f- not to handle it, but uh, to help it. But the other key remedy would be vitamin D3, large amounts, because that will reduce the inflammation. Um, but again, you know, you know, you're working, hopefully you're working with your doctor that can make these adjustments to slow things down a bit because, um, you know, you have a lot of complications, the heart working harder and your eyeballs, you know, bulging out and things like that. So, um, It's an autoimmune, which chances are something may have been triggered in the gut. uh, And now your immune system is kind of inappropriately responding. So vitamin D is the best way to at least reduce the, um, the inflammation part of it, which might, might just put that whole thing in remission. All right. Very good. Next question, sir. This is a true false, sir. Okay. True or false. If you have polyps in your colon, your risk for colon cancer is very high. All right, audience, climb onto that one. <laughs> I can't believe it. Terry, are you making this up? Mask of Sanity is our latest questionnaire uh, from YouTube. What is the best, uh, in your opinion, thiamine or benfotamine? Well, um, it depends. <clears throat> if you have any type of uh, neurological problems, let's say you have peripheral neuropathy in your, your fingers or your feet, or you have um, dementia, or you, you have Alzheimer's and you're taking this, ben, you should take benfotamine because it's a fat-soluble vitamin that penetrates the brain and nervous system because it's, a, it's re- related to the fat membranes. Uh, but for other things, um, you can just do a natural uh, B1 that will work just just fine. Uh, like for example, uh, one of the big reasons people take B1 is because um, they have this nervous energy and stress that they have to reduce. Boy, within minutes, you'll just feel like, oh, I can, I, I feel relaxed, you know? So you can get that from nutritional yeast or just in a, in a supplement form. Um, yes. Very good. Okay, Christy from Facebook. How can I do healthy keto if I'm prone to kidney stones? Just take um, regular um, amounts of uh, lemon in your water. I-, I would recommend just taking the whole lemon, just blending one with water and and uh, maybe a little electrolytes in there as a drink in the morning. That would be really great. But also the most important thing is to take consume 
at least two and a half liters of um, fluids a day. And that way it'll keep your urine uh, from becoming super saturated and developing a stone, uh, regardless if you're prone to stones or not. It, it'd be almost impossible to get a stone if you're drinking this fluid <clears throat> on a regular basis. So that's what I would recommend. And um, also, I you know, I, um, I don't do many commercials for my products or even um, other products, but every once in a while I find a good product um, that I'd, I endorse and this product I'm going to show you right now. I have no affiliation with the company, never even contacted them, but I found a, I was at the store and I found this interesting grain free, grain free cracker that I really was impressed. And I'll tell you why I'm just going to, you know, when I find a good product, I like to tell people about it. So you can see this is uh, by who H U, I guess it's called grain free cracker. Let me just tell you what I like about this. Um, no tapioca, no gluten, no grains, no sunflower oil, no lecithin, no seed or vegetable oils, no maltodextrin. Hey, you got me right there. That's awesome. No refined starches because so many of these crackers have tapioca starch or other starches that are potato starch that are, they, and they call it keto, right? So what does this have in it? It has uh, almond, cassava, organic coconut flour. Perfect. Organic sesame seed, chia seed, onion, sea salt, flax seed, and uh, garlic and rosemary extract. So I was like, wow. And, it, and it, it's not too bad. It's it tastes tastes great. And you can put like your cheese on it or something, but uh, it's always hard to find a good cracker that uh, doesn't have these other things in it. So um, yeah, this is a no kickback endorsement. Uh, I would recommend it. But they also have other chocolates with with sweet and things like that. I don't recommend those, but this is one product that I would definitely recommend if someone wanted to get a cracker, um, not as a snack, but you know, with the meal. Very good. Okay. Latest question asked uh, was a true falser. If you have polyps, your risk of colon cancer will be high. And the audience has addressed this. 65% respondents say that that's true. And the other 35% say it's absolutely false. You know, this is actually false. It's not as common. Like there's, I'm going to do a video on this, but there's like four main kinds of polyps, right? And 80% of the time, you really only have like a 2% chance of, of having it turn into cancer. So the great majority of time, they're benign. So you don't have to freak out if you have a polyp. Um, so that's good news. Um, but if you do have a polyp, um, you know, just um, it's just another motivation to eat clean, you know, because really what you're dealing with is your food. And um, yes, smoking can be a factor, um, but also the food. So as long as you eat healthy and do the right things, um, Many times it's going to be benign. The majority of times it's going to be benign. So you don't have to freak out too bad on that. Um, so stay tuned for a video on more details. Very good. We're going to go to Michael, our last person in the green room. But first, let's kick out another question. All right. True or false? E. coli, okay, creates B vitamins, okay, and helps you break down lactose, milk sugar. That's true or false? All right, climb on that. And Michael, you're on with Dr. Bird. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks for having me on. Uh, sure. So I'm an audio nerd and uh, self-made home engineer. I don't do too much, but uh, I do have tinnitus. And uh, I want to give everybody a pro tip about that method where you cup your ears and flick the base of your skull. Add one of these to the base of your skull. Don't know oh. what brand it is, but it works wonders way better than the fingers. So I'm one of those people that still uses cotton swabs. And I know I shouldn't, but a couple of weeks ago, I ended up digging a little bit too hard, and I think I may have caused a little bit of damage to the membrane in my ear, and uh, I'm a little bit concerned about it, so I do have an appointment with an ENT, and uh, of course, that takes a couple of weeks, and you've, I just want to know, how do I nurse that and appropriately do it? I've heard earplugs and a little bit of petroleum jelly, but what should I do? Yeah, um, yeah, they'll be able to look and see if there's uh, any damage. I think if it was ruptured, you would know it. <laughs> so it's probably just irritated and it could be just, um, you know, just going to take some time to heal. And sometimes when you have inner ear damage, it 
it t- could take some weeks to actually heal depending on how much uh, bruising or, or irritation there is. Um, I would, I wouldn't add too many things into the ear. Um, you have a normal layer of flora. So you want that, you know, that protects things. So you start taking that out too hard. And then all of a sudden now you're susceptible to getting infections and stuff like that. Uh, also, there's an astation tube, a hole in the back of your throat that goes in the back of the ear. Um, and um, a lot of times if you have sinus issues, uh, that you can, it can create more irritation. But I think what I would do if I were you is I'd just kind of leave it alone right now and just, and see what's in there. But, um, you know, there are people that um, they've, they've done some damage to the ear um, and they have a reincurrent microbial imbalances and stuff like that. And in that case, what they do is they take um, just a diluted um, bit of uh, kimchi juice. <laughs> just they dilute that a little bit and they just put a couple drops in there to get the flora back going because that's they have microbes that um, are really good for the sinuses as well as uh, the inner ear. But you have a whole inner microbial life form in there that's protecting you and things like that so um but could i follow up too when i'm yeah. not doing cotton swabs because I'm, I'm gonna stop what should i do to normally get the ear wax out there's there's different out? there's different uh gentle um washes there are different fluids of i, I think one would be uh saline without any chemicals that you can gently kind of flush out the ear um but also i mean I think it's totally okay to take a, a cotton swab and just go superficially, just very gently in that area. I think that's fine. The problem is when people go too deep or they go too hard and they start, you know, just like you're, just like if they clean your face, you're scrubbing too hard. You're just like, and then you end up with all sorts of issues. So uh, I think if you're just gentle, gentle, you'll be fine. But that's a really good tip on that um, that massager that you have on the back of the neck. I'll have to. Uh, um, update a video on that because that probably gives you a lot of uh, quick stimulation in the back of the occiput. Especially right after loud music and concert. Yeah, right, so exactly. Much. All right, that sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Michael, and thanks for hanging in with us uh, as our last uh, respondent from the green room, and that was a great question, uh, and I hope that that uh, helps you out. We've got answers. We've got answers. The latest one, true, false, E. coli creates vitamins and helps you break down lactose. Uh, let's see. Uh, 55% say it's true, and 45% say it's false. Doc, how are they doing? We're very much against uh, this E. coli because uh, people are freaked out about it. But you know that we have a, a quite a bit of E. coli that naturally is in our guts. Uh, it's in animal guts, and uh, basically it's uh, it's friendly. Um it makes B vitamins, B1, B2, B6, B12. And um, it's it's when the environment changes that it becomes pathogenic. So it can morph over into an unhealthy strain. But if you're growing food on good soils and or eating animals that have not had antibiotics, which can then change the environment and cause these unhealthy strains, then you're going to be fine. So... Um, so that's interesting. Yeah, uh, E. coli is a uh, it's it's not normally unfriendly until you piss it off. So um, take care of your guts. Don't upset them. And uh, antibiotics are the biggest culprit. And unfortunately, like eighty percent of the antibiotics are used in uh, animal feeds and things like that, or anim- for animals agriculture. So um, that's how we're getting it indirectly. Then we get these all resistant strains that you can't kill anymore. So it's a problem. All right, very good. We're going to go to Barbara from YouTube, answer her question after we put up the last question. Interested to hear the answer to this one. What is the only sugar that won't spike your blood sugars? And I'm not talking about sugar alcohols or uh, artificial sweeteners. I'm talking about sugar. Like, what's the only one that will not increase your blood sugars? How about that one? I'm dying to know the answer, and I'm sure our audience is too. Research hard. Okay, we promised to go to Barbara from YouTube, and here we go. I have a problem with acid reflux, and it's even triggered by a glass of water. It's triggered by a glass of water. What's wrong with poor Barbara? Um, well, I think that um, I think what I would do is I would um, 
instead of, well, like when you eat, for example, just don't drink any water because I, you're going to maybe dilute the acid and that can actually create more acid reflux. And I think your valve, your valve on the top of the stomach is not closing because you don't have enough acid. And it sounds illogical because you think, wow, I have too much acid. I need to alkalize my stomach. And then it always gets worse. So, um, what I would recommend is, um, watch my videos on heartburn and acid reflux. And you actually take betaine hydrochloride. The only time you wouldn't is if you took, if you had something like, um, like gastritis or an ulcer. And I talk about what to do for that. But typically, um, the way you correct it is by taking this betaine hydrochloride, reestablishing the hydrochloric acid. So the top of the valve can close and, um, and those symptoms will go away, but don't definitely don't drink for your situation. Don't drink water or liquids like right around the meal. Um, yeah. All right. Very good. Then that begs uh, that we asked a question from Christine. Uh, what's the best way to treat Barrett's esophagus? That's a nasty one. Same thing. Same thing. You wanted to take betaine hydrochloride. Um, because what's happening is we have, um, not just acid coming up into the esophagus. We have the, um, enzymes okay that are really powerful protein enzymes like protease enzyme that comes up there that starts digesting your own protein your esophagus the cartilage in there so it's all about keeping that valve shut and tight um some of the pr problem can also be a lack of b1 um because b1 uh helps um make acid because uh uh, of the vagus nerve and the acetylcholine, that, that control. And then you also have um, just the acid itself, just from what you've eaten in the past. So watch my most recent video on digestion where I talk about taking more B1 to actually help this acid problem. And it can even support uh, the valves uh, from, a, from an angle of the autonomic nervous system innervation there. So uh, there's things that you can do naturally. Well, audience, I'm really in your debt because I would probably have been written up uh, if I, because I started the quizzes too late, but we've gotten to all of them. And the last one asked, what is the only sugar that won't spike your blood sugar? And I'm rooting for your audience, of which 45% say stevia, 15% say monk fruit sugar, 10% say natural sugars found in fruits, oops, and vegetables, uh, 10 say honey, Wow, 10% say uh, erythritol, which you said don't say, and 10% say coconut sugar. Okay, so we'll answer this next month on the, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, now, the answer is fructose. Now, hear me out. <clears throat> um, when you check your blood sugar, right, you ever notice um, they're checking the blood glucose level, not the blood fructose level? It's glucose. So when you consume fructose, it doesn't automatically just turn into glucose. So it doesn't actually even um, show up in the blood. It, it gets absorbed and then goes to the liver, but some of it's undigested. It's slower. Um, but here's the catch 22. Fructose is uh, very low on the glycemic index compared to glucose. So fructose is very low which it won't spike your blood sugar. And so they at first thought, hey, this is great. We're going to give it to diabetics and we can sell it at the grocery store and people will buy it as a sweetener. And then they found out, um, whoops, that's a big mistake because the liver is like the only organ that can has to, is forced to deal with this sugar. And uh, it quickly, very quickly, <clears throat> will start building up glycogen and then convert to fat, triglycerides, really fat, really fa uh, fast, and then that creates insulin resistance. So you're, you're going to create more of a problem with your blood sugars indirectly than just raising your blood sugar. So it's actually worse than glucose if you have it, and especially in the high fructose corn syrup. Um, but some of the sugar, especially if it's in fruit, um, kind of passes on into the, through the intestine and, and starts feeding the microbes. And boy, do they like that. And so they just go crazy and uh, you start getting all sorts of gas. And this is why a lot of times when people eat fruit, they gas out too much because you're feeding these microbes and they're just loving it. They're thanking you for it, but it's not always a good thing. So um, 
that would is the only sugar and i'm not recommending it all right very good uh but you did recommend that those cool uh who crackers and we're getting a several comments from that asking won't the cassava flour disrupt ketosis so cassava flour um it's it's a type of it's there's very small amounts of it it's out of all the different flours um it's probably the uh, a, a good one to take compared to everything else okay in a cracker and also um it's it is considered a resistant starch um so it's definitely going to be fine in small, small amounts compared to everything else, you know, the tapioca, the potato. Um, so I don't recommend consuming cassava in large amounts, but if you, if you take a look at all the ingredients out there that they're using now with these so-called keto uh, snacks, especially they're using dextrose, they're using corn soluble, um, starch and, um, corn fiber and soy and all this stuff, uh, cassava would be something that's a lot better than these other ones. So, um, yeah, that's why I recommend it. And also there's no grains. I mean, there's no also, um, the, that darn hidden maltodextrin, which is all synthetic. So the, these are things that are, um, a lot of the new fibers now that they're putting in all these keto things are untested long-term. And so I think what they're going to find uh, is that um, like, oh, so we shouldn't have recommended this because it creates a lot of bowel problems and digestive issues and blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Just just like, for example, Steve, you know, how many years have doctors recommended like an aspirin a day for uh, if you have heart problems? Long time. Yeah. Now they're saying the even there's a study by the AMA. They said that, uh, well, you know, we found that it actually does not increase the outcomes that we thought. I mean, all these years, and then they find out that, wow, maybe we shouldn't recommend it. This is happening so much with so many different things. After a while, you know, your trust goes down in some of these recommendations. So um, you want to stick with something that is, uh, has stood the test of time. Okay, very good. I know we're running out of time, but we have an emergency, Dr. Berg. Daniel from Facebook has had nonstop hiccups for three days. Now he's got to be sick of that. Any, any recommendations for poor Daniel? Well, I did a video on this. Um, you know, you, you, um, it's a bit of a autonomic nervous system glitch in the circuitry. Um, you know, I'm sure you try to drink a glass of water upside down, but, uh, I would take, uh, some B1, get some B1 and start taking that immediately to stop it. Um, and also I would do things to support the gallbladder because sometimes uh, you could have some congestion in the gallbladder and that could be irritating uh, the neurological reflex that's occurring. So you may even want to try, look up my video on gallbladder flushing and manually massage the gallbladder and the, even the pancreas underneath your stomach to create more space in there. It could be congested. Um, I had one lady that came in my clinic and she, she had chronic burping for the entire year and it, it happened after she did this um, protein powder, a low fat protein powder mix that the weight loss doctor gave her, who, by the way, who was, who was obese. And um, it's like a, if you go to a dentist and they have uh, they have rotten teeth, um, you might want to think twice. But um, so it was her gallbladder it got just completely messed with her gallbladder. And she had this her, uh, burping thing. So that's what I would recommend if I were you. All righty. Well, guess what time it is, doc? Yes. Well, pr I appreciate all the wonderful questions and the comments and the attention. I read the comments and uh, stay tuned for some more in more data, more knowledge. So ha have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.